As both Mark Twain and the title of the 2006 Will Ferrell movie tell us, truth is stranger than fiction. It should be no surprise, then, that true stories are prime resources for filmmakers to find amazing and inspiring stories. In 2017, three of the nine Best Picture nominees were based on real people's stories. However, these are still movies, and inevitable artistic and dramatic license on the part of the creators can make a film deviate far from the truth on which they're based. But to what end? How much content in some of the best-known historical movies is real, and how much is just made up? In this presentation, I'll review seven movies based on historical figures or events, and analyze their inaccuracies. Apollo 13 is praised for being extremely accurate to the real events that it's based on, namely the titular failed moon mission. Director Ron Howard and his colleagues went to great lengths to keep everything as accurate as possible, including filming in zero gravity. The film, of course, contains small technical errors, like the wrong NASA logo being featured on a fuel tank, the color of Jim Lovell's car being red instead of blue, and the fact that in this shot, Apollo 13 is about the size of Australia. However, there are more major inaccuracies present, mostly exaggerations. Ken Mattingly, the would-be astronaut who was kept grounded due to possible sickness, Oh, I've had the measles. Ken Mattingly hasn't. Damn. Had his role increased significantly. For example, when NASA needs to find a way to preserve the astronauts' electricity, they bring in Mattingly to help. In real life, it was mainly other astronauts doing simulation runs, but in the film, Mattingly does it solo. Additionally, the devices that NASA seemingly invents on the day, like the all-important CO2 filter, already existed. However, these historical shortcomings barely scratch the surface in terms of things filmmakers have done to change true stories. Although amplifying the role of a character and increasing tension somewhat artificially may seem significant, Apollo 13 is basically as spot on as major Hollywood productions get. Well, almost. There's a website called Information is Beautiful, which shows the historical accuracy of recent historically based movies with a clean percentage and comprehensive data to back it up. Only one listed movie, Selma, has ever achieved a 100% score. That's about the pinnacle of historical accuracy. Now let's see just how bad it can get. Directed by the most kind and pure-hearted individual to ever walk the earth, Apocalypto is one of the very few movies about Maya civilization. Although it's historical fiction, it manages to get more things wrong about the time period than you might think possible. The film is about the collapse of Maya civilization. This gives two main possibilities for the time it's set in. The Maya existed in a significant way until the 1500s, but it's more likely that the movie is set during the classic Maya collapse of the 900s the more well-known option. Many characteristics of the classic collapse are present, including dying crops, but after that nothing makes sense. The main character's hometown is incredibly underdeveloped for the Maya. There are no stone foundations, religious or governmental buildings, or even crops, one of the things that the Maya are distinguished for. The first scene depicts a hunter-gatherer society, something that would not have happened much in Maya towns. Furthermore, it's in the middle of the jungle. It's totally unlike any Maya town on record. Later on, what the characters are taken to be sacrificed, and with great efficiency, I might add. I mean, there's there's a massive grave of beheaded bodies, which, which I, will, I will not show because I'm pretty sure that's the dictionary definition of not safe for work. Anyway, the sacrifice method used by the priests is taken directly from the Aztecs, a civilization who are definitely not the Maya. Now, this might be excused if the story was set in the 1500s, but again, it seems unlikely. But now for the cardinal sin of this movie. At the very end, Spanish conquistadors rock up and make contact. Now this could, again, be excused. Either the movie is set in the 1500s, or this convoy of ships was caught in a rare temporal vortex. But, oh yeah, there's a kid with smallpox in our inn. What? Smallpox was a disease brought over by the Europeans, who we see landing what is either a few days or a few hundred years later. Now, one is admittedly more extreme than the other, but either way, it makes no sense. This just goes to show how confused and misrepresented Apocalypto's Mayan history is. The powerful Schindler's List follows Oskar Schindler, a German industrialist during World War II who finds morality in an immoral time. While the movie is generally accurate, there are a few things that it got quite wrong. Although it is debated in the historical community, it's very likely that Schindler didn't have much to do with Schindler's list. Even if he was instrumental in its creation, it wouldn't have all been like what the movie portrays, with Schindler and his managers settling down and typing it in together. His manager wasn't even working for him at the time the list was created, and Schindler himself was in jail for bribing Ralph Fiennes' annoyingly voiced Eamon the Goth. Nobody knows who stole the chicken. In a recent development, the possibility that Schindler also led a German unit responsible for planning the invasion of Poland has arisen. Though Schindler sidled up to the Nazis, this seems pretty out of character still. Taking the sheen off his final act of saving over 1,100 Jewish people from concentration camps. Which, which really happened, don't worry.
Paxar Ridge is about Desmond Doss, a conscientious objector who fought in World War II and saved about 75 people without even carrying a gun. You're a conscientious objector, and you joined the army. Well, no, sir, I'm... I'm a conscientious cooperator. Mel Gibson returns with his fifth very biased and historically inaccurate movie, including Braveheart, The Passion of the Christ? We Were Soldiers, The Patriot, and, of course, The Expendables 3. Although this is a fantastic movie, it sports an unencouraging rating of 51.5% on the accuracy site. Many aspects of the story are left out, like how Doss' unit participated in the Battle of Guam and Leyte before going to Hacksaw Ridge in Okinawa. However, this movie makes up or significantly changes more of its plot than it leaves out. Many of the colorful personalities of Doss' unit, such as Knife Foot Man, Private Idiot, Naked Man, and Cheekbone Man, never really existed. The incident that leads Doss to the hospital where he meets his future wife, who was not a nurse at the time, never happened. Doss was never put in jail before his court hearing on refusing to handle a rifle, probably because he didn't have a court hearing. They changed the way he met his wife, they made up the bit where he hits his brother with a brick, and they greatly exaggerated the hostility of his father. They even changed the story of why Doss is a conscientious objector. In real life, his uncle and father were having a drunken fight. His father pulled out a gun, and his mother intervened. Doss called the police and was told to hide the gun, and soon after saw his father being arrested. In the movie, the father, with his abusive drunk factor turned up to 11, is gonna shoot his wife before Desmond steps in and saves the day. Inspiring, but wrong. <laughs> Hidden Figures is about the hidden story of three hidden figures in NASA, who work against racist and sexist prejudice to find hidden figures. A as in, is in math. This movie was able to take a lot of license without the audience knowing, being an untold story. I think the biggest adjustment to the story is the timelines of the characters' major successes. Looking back on it, it seems improbable that the three friends, who never carpooled, would all have their successes simultaneously. The movie is set in 1961. Actually, Dorothy Vaughn was appointed supervisor of the West Computing Group in 1949, and Mary Jackson was given the position of engineer in 1958. No dramatic court hearing needed. In fact, NASA was quite progressive for the time. When the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics became NASA in 1958, they did away with all the segregated departments like the West Computing Group, integrating all its workers. All these events were either ignored or moved up to line up with John Glenn's launch. The recurring scene where Catherine has to run all the way back to the West Computing Group to use the washroom was fabricated. In real life, Johnson was unaware that the washrooms were segregated and nobody complained. Consequently, the scene where Al Harrison knocks down the sign above the segregated washroom never happened. Al Harrison also is an actual person, so uh, that's a contributor as well. Set directly following the Watergate break-in that ended up leading to Richard Nixon resigning as President of the United States, all the President's men follows two reporters from the Washington Post as they attempt to uncover the whole truth about the incident. While the film went to painstaking lengths to make certain things as accurate as possible, they recreated an entire phone book, which seems a little excess to me, and kept the story very similar, they omit characters and events a lot. In reality, there were about 40 President's men and a multitude of sources that Bernstein and Woodward consulted, much more than the movie shows. One of the most important members of the post staff that helped them was cut, and the role of another was trivialized. They also greatly reduced the role of the White House. Their spokesperson only appeared once in the movie, in comparison to the book where the White House would denounce almost every significant story the Post put out. A Beautiful Mind is a marvel of inaccuracy, a real benchmark that historically inaccurate movies should never ever try to live up to. The movie's John Nash, a brilliant Nobel Prize winning mathematician, deviates a lot from the John Nash written about in his biography, also called A Beautiful Mind. The filmmaker sugarcoat his personality, and even his life to some degree. In the movie he's kind of weird and somewhat antisocial. In reality he was considered childish and arrogant, and was very socially withdrawn, hated by many at his school, Princeton. He was mostly tolerated just because of his mathematical genius. It's safe to assume from this that he didn't often go to bars with lots of his friends, some of whom didn't exist. Additionally, he probably didn't have the eureka moment of his famous Nash equilibrium, the principle that would win him a Nobel Prize, while trying to pick up women at a bar. Thank you. One of the two major romantic relationships Nash had in his life is completely ignored in the movie. Before Alicia, his love interest in the movie, he was with a woman named Eleanor, whom Nash fathered a child with before abandoning her. Nash and Alicia didn't have a perfect relationship either. Nash began to get schizophrenic symptoms after they married. This played a big role in their divorce, which isn't in the movie, of course. The movie takes a lot of creative license with this. First, let's do a quick run-through of the actual effects Nash's schizophrenia had on him. He saw codes in newspapers that he believed to be from extraterrestrials, claimed to be the Emperor of Antarctica, thought the government was conspiring with aliens to ruin his reputation, and spent months wandering Europe desperately trying to renounce his US citizenship and found a world government. In the movie, though, things happen completely differently. He is hired by the CIA's Ed Harris to help them fight a communist conspiracy. William Parcher, Big Brother. 
At first I thought this was the movie's twisted version of Rand, a government think tank that Nash worked at for many years, but no, they just removed that. Instead, this gives an excuse for Ed Harris to yell at him, Oh! Worthless! Discard it! And get mathematician John Nash into a car chase firefight where he Desmond Dosses it. Take the goddamn gun! No! Well, I'm sorry, Sergeant. I can't touch a gun. However, in a plot twist worthy of M. Night Shyamalan, we find out this whole thing, as well as his old school roommate, were all just delusions. This doesn't make any sense for a number of reasons. A. Nash's schizophrenia only started long after graduate school. B. His delusions weren't visual hallucinations. This is extremely uncommon for schizophrenic patients and did not happen to Nash. And C. Delusions being delusions are never organized. While I wouldn't call this organized, having recurring characters and what is basically a plot running inside his head bomb, 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 the bomb, the bomb. not only didn't happen, but is extremely unlikely generally. Additionally, at the end of the film, Nash just kind of ignores his delusions instead of recovering, which is both more believable and what actually happened. I've been gone. No, I've gotten used to ignoring them, and I think as a result, they've kind of given up on me. But everything's okay at the end of the movie. He delivers his Nobel acceptance speech that he never actually delivered, and all the professors give him their pens, a famous Princeton initiation tradition that, that does not exist. So why are these changes made? Well, I saw a few patterns through all my viewings of these different movies to make the movie more coherent and contained. Life usually does not follow a three-act structure, and the truth isn't always a perfect fit for the rough structure of a film. In addition to the two to two and a half hour time constraint, it's understandable to see why movies almost never tell the entire basis story verbatim. Filmmakers have to change the plot to make it make more sense as a movie, usually structurally. For example, Desmond Doss's participation in two battles before Hacksaw Ridge was cut to make the film more concise and concentrated. And All the President's Men cut out the last and arguably most important months of Watergate, in favor of a mind-numbingly loud typewriter telling us what happened. And I assume to shorten the runtime. Dramatic effect. It's arguably more important to make your film compelling and competent than it is to make it 100% accurate. In some cases, this can work out perfectly, but a lot of the time you're going to have to sacrifice certain things and make up others to reinforce aspects of the movie like themes or recurring plot elements. In All the President's Men, White House officials are purposefully seen very sparsely to give the feeling of inaccessibility and their distance from the rest of the world. The bathroom scenes in Hidden Figures is definitely something that happened in the real world, just not in the context of the movie, but it was included because it simply exemplifies a key message of the movie. There's a scene early in Hacksaw Ridge where Doss ties a rope knot incorrectly, and Vince Vaughn's character insults him about it. Later on, when Doss is saving him with that knot, there's a joke about it. Vince Vaughn's character wasn't saved by Doss, but placing him in that situation allowed for some dramatic irony. Other times, things are exaggerated to amplify the emotion that they're meant to bring out. This is Hacksaw Ridge in the movie, and this is Hacksaw Ridge in real life. Hollywoodification. I'm doing air quotes. Hollywood and cinema goers love spectacle and relatable characters, and it's hard to relate to someone on screen who you can't sympathize with or like. John Nash was a difficult, unlikable guy in real life. Strange, antisocial, rude, self-obsessed, and childish. In the movie, he was an overall nice guy with a few eccentricities. The filmmakers did this to bring the audience closer to Nash and make him more deserving of our support and sympathy when things got rough for him. Having an action-packed car chase is more engaging than wandering Europe. Evidence of Oscar Schindler having a hand in planning Poland's invasion was ignored because it conflicts with the core plot of Oscar Schindler saving Jews from the Nazis. And sometimes it's the opposite. The flamboyant costumes of the bad guys in Apocalypto make it painfully obvious that they're bad guys. They have no redeeming qualities and you can't relate to a guy with human jawbones as epaulets. While movie adaptations by definition can't be 100% true to the whole thing, and aren't documentaries, we expect a certain level of honesty going into them. Often creative license and entertainment factor exceed the importance of telling the whole truth. If you want that, do some research or read a biography. I'm not trying to denounce historical movies. They're important in raising awareness of people and events that the public might otherwise not be aware of. And they're definitely movies that go to the distance to tell the truth. Just keep in mind that these movies are based on true stories. Being skeptical is important, especially in our day and age. And these movies are a good place to be a bit skeptical in. And while questioning can reduce the amount of incorrect historical information people think is true, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to watch a movie that's based on a true story in the same way again.